Hey everyone, my guest today is the award-winning screenwriter, Broadway librettist, and novelist Heather Hawk. Heather's work includes screenwriting for the movies Freaky Friday and What to Expect When You're Expecting, and she wrote the book for the Broadway musical Legally Blonde. She was formerly an improv comedy cast member with Comedy Sports, an editor at Sports and Fitness Publishing, and a judge on the MTV reality show The Search, for the next Elle Woods. Heather has a book coming out soon called The Trouble with Drowning, which I was just telling her before we started recording. I am loving and how thrilling. Uh, and welcome, Heather, to the podcast. Oh, thank you for having me. This is fun to be here with you. Oh, it's so great. I think back to Jerry Mitchell was the choreographer on You're a Good Man, Charlie Brown, uh, a, a musical that I did yeah. on Broadway. And it was Aww. so clear to me at the time that he should be directing. And he has and does. And Legally Blonde is just um, such a touchstone for so many of us who love Broadway musicals, who then go on to have children who love Broadway musicals. So to get to tell you in person, thank you for bringing so much fun and joy and, a, and an iconic character into our lives in the way that you did. So I want to talk about so many things and we will end with your new book because that is your newest baby coming out yeah. into the world. Um, can you share with my listeners how, because I just read like comedy cast member and an editor at a sports magazine, you have like had a fascinating career. Talk to me a little bit about transitioning from one thing to the other and when did you just fall in love with being a writer in the world of the arts like you are well uh I've always been a writer I mean since day one actually I started as a really prodigious liar um <laughs> my mom would have to follow me around and be like that's not true my best friend's dad thought he my best friend's mother thought that my dad was not my dad for a year. Because you told them that. Yeah. I was like, nah, my mom got remarried. Um, and I, yeah, I had a brother, I had a brother in prison. Like I had these terrible lies, but I just like telling stories. And I'm just so grateful oh that my, my parents God. never told me I was doing something horrible. They just knew I had a big imagination. Well, they knew to just walk behind you and quickly go, no, that's no, not that's, that's made up. That's made up. Um, yeah. What What is that? You know, I have talked to so many people on this podcast and I too am someone in a sleepaway camp where it would be so easy to find out. I wasn't like one of triplets in the camp. Yeah. Like there was, there was right. no other sibling there. Like the things that we made up, I'm really fascinated by that. When you look back, I knew that it wasn't true. I wasn't a crazy person. I knew I wasn't a triplet, but it felt very real to me at the yeah. time. Well, like when you think back to that time and now you get paid for it, which is incredible. What right. is that? What is that? Because not everybody does that. No, I just think some people are storytellers and we all know at a very young age that real life is not quite interesting enough. Mm -hmm. That's why we seek out stories. I mean, I always say everybody's a storyteller and everybody dreams. Everybody tells stories about their own life, about their own reality in an unconscious state. That's how much we want to tell stories. Hmm. So we're all storytellers, whether you're good at math or a computer person, you're still telling stories at night in your sleep. Right. I just think that some of us have a little bit more interest in the subject matter. Right, right. So, okay, always a storyteller, loved writing. Always loved writing, always loved reading. That was really the only thing. Well, that, and I love pe making people laugh. That was mm -hmm. just really early on, I realized, well, this is a win-win because- I feel good making people laugh and they feel good because they're laughing. So I was like, right. you know, what, what more can you want? Right. Um, yeah. And what about going from, I love to make people laugh in my living room or in the classroom to yeah. sort of going, well, wow, like I'm aware that other people do this for a living, the sort of segue to like, I'm going to pursue this in some way professionally. How did that happen? Yeah. I mean, I went to um, University of Colorado. I went to the journalism school. So I actually, my first job out of college was at the New York Times Denver Bureau. 
I was a research assistant and I would try to find story ideas for my boss, Dirk Johnson, before they were stories. So I still do that today. I'm still trying to find the zeitgeist before the zeitgeist is out there. You know, what's the kind of bubbling story underneath? And um, that is something I still completely do today. So I wanted to be a journalist because I thought that was the way, you know, I could make a living as a writer. I also thought maybe I'd be an advertising copywriter. I thought I had, I thought that sounded interesting and right. Couldn't, felt like 30 something, the TV show to me. Um, so it was all very practical. Um, doing my, you know, the improv comedy for years in Denver with a troupe, that was just more play and, and a wonderful way to kind of exercise, you know, that side of me. Um, but it really didn't become apparent to me that this might become a actual job because I didn't know anyone in Hollywood. It seemed like such a mysterious industry. Um, but I went through a really terrible divorce in Denver that was sort of rocked me to my knees and it allowed, and I'm so grateful for it because it allowed me to ask myself, well, what do I really want to do? What do I really love? And I came up with three things, which were comedy, writing, and movies. Um, musicals was always in there, but that was another even further away fantasy. Um, so I just decided my life was going so crappy in Denver. I might as well try to have a crappy life somewhere in LA. And if it didn't work, so what? Like what, right. what's the harm of that? Like, what was I clinging to? My my unsuccessful life in Denver. That's what it felt like at the time. Yeah. So I decided to, to do it and try it. I was going to give it five years. And I won the Walt Disney uh, Screenwriting Fellowship with a script based on my divorce called I Used to Be an Honor Student. Okay. So you submit, you submit a, a writing sample to the script. Yep. Yeah. Called um, I used to be an honor student. I wanted it to be sort of a heartburn, but for a younger because I I was literally divorced at age twenty five. None of my friends were married, and I'm a divorcee. And you were already done. Yeah, I mean, I was like suddenly having like support therapy divorce groups mm -hmm. in Aurora or Lakewood living rooms with fifty five year olds, and I'm twenty five. Where you know, are was, you from? Where did you grow up? I grew up for the first ten years of my life in Ames, Iowa. And then we moved to uh, Loveland, Colorado. I'm from Colorado. That's okay. where I live. And that's where I lived for- Right, but LA was not familiar. So this was a big move. Oh yeah, I was terrified of, but I think when you're just at bottom, I just needed change. I needed to, and I was like, if I'm not gonna have a good personal life, I'm gonna have a great professional life. And I also really did believe underneath it all. I've always been a little stardusty and um, I knew it was going to work. And I think you have to have that belief in yourself. Right. And so when you went to LA, did you, so you win this, I mean, that's like a nice feather in your cap and a confidence booster, right? To win something. Well, I got to quit my writing assistant job. And I got a stipend and I got assigned a producer and a, and an executive. And Is that they how it works? They like you win this thing and they bring you out and they sort of set you up to begin. Yeah. No, they pay a stipend so you can live and um, you get assigned, you know, people at Disney and you write two scripts during that year. And then and you get all the great, you know, speakers and it was phenomenal. Wow. So there's mentorship and there's like boots on the ground, actual real world doing the thing. Um, so what was your first job? Freaky Friday. Okay. This is okay. So how long after you were there did Freaky Friday happen? It all was so fast and easy. I was like, what's the problem? Hollywood's a blast. I'm having a great time. It's so easy. Now it's it's absolutely not. It would be, so it would be different now, you think? Everything's different now. I don't even know if Freaky Friday would be made now. Um, it, I mean, I know there's a sequel that no one's talked to me about, which is lovely, um, which is the way it works. Little known fact, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, it's just, it's, it's, it's a very competitive, you know, it's a, it's a rough business. Um, it's all it rough. wasn't for you at the beginning, which is incredible. Uh, how did Freaky Friday happen? 
I wrote my first script within the program that I had um, the producer and an executive. I wrote this really dark comedy called Not Kappa Material. And it was set in a sorority, kind of like a Heather's at a sorority. And they loved it. They wanted to make it. We had a director at one point and people were stars were interested in it. But because of that, Nina Jacobson, the president of Disney, read it and loved it. She's like, mate, she's going to write Freaky Friday. So they already had Freaky Friday in the in the canon. They were ready talking to go. about it. Yeah. And right. then Princess Diaries did really well. So um, they brought me on and we were off to the races. And is that a script, you know, you learn so much about, um, you have to be very like sleuth-like when you watch credits and films now to sort of understand who wrote the first, second, third, fourth, fifth drafts of something. Yeah. Was this a movie that was written by committee or do you feel like you had a lot of autonomy? I had a lot of autonomy. I mean, I share credit with Leslie Dixon and you know, I got it greenlit. I mean, that was the best, one of the best phone calls I've ever gotten in my life is Nina love my script and we're making your movie. And I remember just bawling, you know, on the floor after. Um, so I got, and then I worked a little bit with the director when he, Mark Waters came on. Um, but then, you know, it really gets taken from you. It's very hard to have that process. I'm still, you know, part of it it's just it's it's so unnatural and scary but it's it's what happens on everybody's movie unless you're like Wes Anderson or whatever right I was gonna say someone who has like complete control of the entire there's almost no one right so you're doing Freaky Friday and like talk about like being shot out of a cannon were there you know you mentioned Nina Jacobson and obviously working with different people. Were there mentors at the beginning of your career? Because Leslie Dixon was actually on this podcast also. Oh, really? And just talking, yeah, yeah. I, I did a whole bunch of stuff up at the Nantucket Film Festival and she was being honored. And so she came on and we had a good deep dive into process. Uh -huh. um, and I learned a lot from her actually, but I'm curious when you when you think back to mentorship, were there people in your life who really were impactful in that way for you? I mean, there's so, I think anyone who's ending up in this lucky position that we're talking to one another um, is because of all these hands that have helped pull you up along the way. Um, and I could go back to high school. I mean, I had Mr. Rulier, who was my, it was called forensics. It was a speech and debate competition. And I was doing really well as a sophomore Lincoln Douglas debate, but he's the one who wanted me to do comedy and do co the humor competition. And I, I switched and he was such a great, you know, advocate for me and who I am, me, my soul, which is a storyteller and a little reverent and funny. And, um, that changed my life. That changed my confidence because I started, you know, winning most of the competitions and it was just a game changer for me. You know, we live in a society where like it or not, and we're all trying to break out of the lanes that people decide we should stay in, you know, objectively on the planet we live in, you are a beautiful blonde woman. And, uh, you know, there are sort of rules about who can be in comedy and who, can't be in comedy and and this was the 80s so this is a yes. time when that storyline was not as prevalent as it is today yeah so and how I, did you can we talk about that yeah I mean it's you know it's such a thorny weird thing but yeah the fact that Mr. Rulier saw me I mean I was the homecoming queen you know and I, one of the reasons because I was fun and nice and you know people like me so I think as much as I was all that, but, but he saw beyond that and, you know, really saw my soul and, and at such a formidable age at age 16, when you're, I figured out your identity and it was just so good to be rewarded for me and for my abilities. And, um, that was just so empowering. And I, you know, I wonder sometimes who I would have, would I have done improv? Would I have had the, con you know, it's just, it's really, he really changed my life. 
It's so and incredible. I, that and we're in touch. Person. Yeah. I, he knows it. And when I was, you know, indoctrinated or whatever into the, my high school's hall of fame, he got, mm-hmm. he came to present it from Missouri and, you it's know, so sweet. That's so sweet. I love that. So legally blonde in some ways deals with this trope, right? Like someone yeah. being, you know, really stuck in a box and this is your place. You're this person and her proving herself. It's incredible to me just in the 10 minutes we've been talking or however long it is to kind of see the parallels in terms of your life and Elle Wood's life. So that seemed like a really big deal. Um, It certainly was a big deal on Broadway. It was the first time there was like a reality series, like a star search kind of American Idol um, companion piece when it was being recast. Yeah. I mean, I have so many questions about this. Um, Tell me, uh, when you talk about sort of writing by committee in the screen and film and television land, um, did you feel like, working on a Broadway musical was very similar or a completely different beast in certain ways? Both. Mostly different um, in the sense that, first of all, as the librettist, you're just treated so much better. I mean, you know, the writer is king and God in, you know, in Broadway and you're respected so much more and you don't just get pushed out. Right. Um, and that is so refreshing, but it's still a complete collaboration. I mean, every art form is a c- complete collaboration. It doesn't. Well, it exist. should be right. I mean, that's the that's the hope, right? Yeah. So, I mean, I've had to work with with directors, producers, um, but you know, it's so much more collaborative with Broadway, with working with Nell and Larry and Jerry and the producers. But just the intimacy of you know, the book writer and, and the lyricist in particular, um, that that symbiotic relationship. So my brain is freezing. I can't even remember what year we're talking, but there's also a movie of Legally Blonde. So yeah. tell me, um, I, I can't remember sort of how many years in between one happened and then the other, but what is that like? I mean, there's source material. But yeah, Amanda Brown, who's a, one of my dearest friends, um, did and that now, happen? Did that happen because of this, or was she already a friend? No, we met um, at some legally blonde event and just got off. You know, went up. Well, that didn't work. Um, that sentence um, got on like a house of fire. And we have these weird things in common. I mean, she has all these relatives that work in Ames, Iowa, where I was born, and you know, it's just crazy. His um, yeah. Isn't it? Yeah. And I'm going to be speaking at her bookstore for my new book. You know, it's just crazy. She's, she gave me a great blurb for my book. Nice. Uh, what was the question? <laughs> my question is, so when you were, oh, yeah, Howard, that, yeah, the book came out first, then the movie a couple years later, and it, it was pretty quick. I mean, the movie came out in what, 2000, 2000. Yeah, ish. That's what I was saying. I don't remember exactly when. And what year yeah. was was Legally Blonde brought to Broadway? And then I worked on it to for in two thousand seven. So I worked on it for about four years. Which is so quick. was she a part of the process? I mean, did you meet to talk about sort of adapting it for the stage, or was it just handed to you, and you could do whatever you want? Basically, were there parameters? Like, what were the rules of adapting this for the stage? Well, there were no rules per se, uh, but I think that we all kind of had the same vision that the fine line and the challenge was going to be honoring what people love about Legally Blonde and, you know, tapping into some of that familiarity and some of those, you know, the bend and snap and the what like it's hard of it all, but also uh, how to invent it and how to dig deeper. And did we go in a totally different direction with the new trial, you know, a new case. Um, But we decided that really the biggest differences we were going to make were in the relationships themselves and digging deeper. And obviously the first round of casting was not an MTV reality show. That was for Laura Bell's replacement. So can you talk a little bit about what it was to see these characters come to life? Because it's rare that as a screenwriter, you're in the casting process at all. 
unless you're doing a teeny indie that you direct yourself. So tell me about, I assume you got to be in the room and sort of be a part of that casting process. Was Bernie Telsey the OG casting director for the show? Yep. Yep. Okay. So, so talk, can you, and by the way, we will move on. You've done so many things, but I have a very broad way. Um, no, I love talking about love, Broadway. Love loving listeners. Okay, get me started. Okay, good. And so tell us everything. Tell us everything. Um, it was just, yeah, it was so surreal to have all these wonderful people come. I mean, Anna Gasteyer came in to audition for Paulette, you know, and I was just like, how is this even remotely possible on this planet that this is happening right now in my life? Yeah, yeah. You're like, okay, and there's Orfe too. I mean, yeah. it, it could go, I mean, everybody's amazing. That's the thing at that level, right? Everyone who comes in is actually amazing. So- yeah. Yeah. You, right. Like, okay, it could be Anna Gasteyer and it could be Orfe. And why can't we have a world where they both do it and switch off? And totally. Yeah. Rachel Dratch did a ton of, um, was Paulette for a lot of readings. And she actually gave me a blurb too, for my book. All these hilarious, amazing people. So was it very clear when Laura Bell Bundy came in that you were all, is that it? Like everyone's hair stands up on the back of their neck at for the me. same time? For me, I mean, I know Jerry wanted her because of hairspray and she is Elwood. So she walked in. I still remember what she was wearing. Like, I remember the shoes. I remember the dress. It was this hot pink with elephant prints, like kind of spaghetti strap with these gold heels. And I don't know. She just, she has a confidence to her. She has a kindness to her and a smarts. And it worked. Yeah. And it worked. And it was such an amazingly, um, I mean, to sit in that audience. And also what's so great is it was filmed. Like people who couldn't come to New York and yeah. see were able to see the show. And that was also, I thought, so unprecedented. Like, let's share this thing somehow with people who don't live here or can't yeah. afford to fly here. It was sort of a lot of unprecedented stuff happened around on that show I do want to talk about the sort of reality show component that ended up happening because that was like exciting and strange in yeah. a way um to suddenly see you like as a judge not just as someone like in an artistic um environment was there pressure to um sensationalize the process in any way and how did you feel about that Oh, a hundred percent. And it has, you know, it's inevitable. It's, it, it is the beast of reality TV, but when someone comes in and they're not right, it's thank you so much. Thank you for coming in. You know, I don't have, I'm not, I don't like confrontation, you know, I'm not a mean person and they wanted to amp up like you're angry at her and you know, you're, what do you really think? And huh. good TV, but that's not how I wanted to operate. Right. Any planet, let alone this, this one. Right. So, but we took it so seriously. Like Bernie, Paul and I were dying because we were, and you just, I do completely agree that you forget that the camera's there. That's like, true. Like how quickly yeah. do you, huh? Not immediately. And you were always kind of aware, but you do, you do forget to some degree. I mean, it, I can kind of see the, the logic and the, the real housewives of Broadway casting. Or I, they know they're doing. on camera, yes. but you do kind of forget. Huh. And you experience that. A little bit. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So that, um, that then went on. I mean, Tony and Drama Desk and Olivier Award wins and sort of oh. all of these wonderful, wonderful. So for someone who grew up in Iowa, what was yeah. your relationship to Broadway or cast recordings or musicals in general? Well, I always say my mother is a living Broadway musical. I mean, she she sings all the time and she knows all the words. And I didn't know how much I kind of knew by osmosis oh, yeah. yeah and so I've always been a huge huge fan but for me it was I mean she took me to chorus line when it came to Ames um and I we I never gone to New York so it wasn't even an option but I love music movie musicals I mean you know I just 
I always love the form. And like when I did improv comedy, uh, my favorite game to play was Broadway musical. I, it's always kind of been in my, in my bones. Like when little shop of horrors came out and I had the, the, the movie cast album, you know, and I, I was listening to that in my car and not, you know, Bon Jovi. So, so you were a musical theater nerd. I like just, the rest I didn't of us. know it. I was. But you were. Yeah. yeah. I was, even though I didn't know as much and I still don't, you know, I'm still not like a lot of these wonderful fans out there. Right. Um, who, who were obsessed and deep dived into every. And they deep dive and it's easier to deep dive now with the internet. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. But like for me, a great musical, uh, there's nothing better. There's also nothing, nothing worse. Let's be honest. Yeah, it's it's disheartening when the thing you love so oh, much. Yeah. I, I mean, I think about, you know, I I just find the whole thing. I, I am such a, like all of us, such a voracious reader, a lover of writing, a lover of musicals, a lover of theater, of films. It's like content just really makes me happy. It's why I do this podcast. When I yeah. get to meet the, the creators of it, I just can't believe that out of your head can come all these ideas. For example, if you asked me, like literally, if you held a gun to my head and you were like, okay, we're going to kill you unless you figure out how to make what to expect when you're expecting into a movie, right? I'd be like, wait, I don't understand. That was my Bible when I was pregnant. How could that chapter one, you know, this is how big your, your baby is right now. Right, right. And this is Braxton Hicks. Like the idea that you were able to take this Bible for so many American women, certainly, I know it's you know, a big yeah. bestseller. I don't know globally if that's like the Bible as well uh -huh. and make it into, I mean, I told my daughter, I was interviewing you and by the way, legally blonde, we couldn't go to any place that she was trepidatious about without listening to the cast recording as a way to like, if we could uh -huh. sing through legally blonde, I could drop her off at camp and she'd be okay. Like the way that uh, the way that it was um, a salve for anxiety. And then when I told her, you know, do you know she also wrote What to Expect when you're expecting? She's like, okay, first of all, that's the most unbelievable cast in any one movie. In the She like, literally, she was like, oh yeah, and this one and that one and Cameron Diaz. And I was like, wow. So we were both talking this morning about, you know, obviously it's quite a departure from the source material in the most amazing way, but can you take me through? Cause I get to have you here and you wrote yeah. that you're like, okay, I'm going to have to, I'm going to pitch this. Yeah. Well, I love adaptations. Like this is a theme. I love taking existing material right, and, and putting a spin on it and making it my own. I really feel like that's kind of my sweet spot. Um, I was pregnant with my son when I sold it, I was about eight months pregnant. So oh I waddled God. into all these, you know, rooms and. That's it, fantastic. A lot of people would try to stuff a pillow in their, in their oh shirt no. to make it seem like that, but you I were had, the real deal, baby. Yeah. Drake ready to go. And I was writing it like two weeks after he was born. I mean, I was in the thick of it. So it, it was very emotional connection for me because it was, you know, it was my story at the time. Um, and I mean, really think about it. There are three trimesters. There are three acts in a movie. Um, it was really just coming up with a lot of different realities for what birth and pregnancy means and tracking all these different storylines. Right. And, up, and, you know, it changed a lot, um, from what I wrote, they brought in another writer and that was very hard for me mm -hmm. to, I mean, they really kept the Elizabeth Banks and the Anna Kendrick storyline is really mine. And the basic, there's just a lot of the stories. It, it followed a pretty tra trajectory that I figured out. Um, but it was hard. That was hard process. Right. You, the process of having something not be yours anymore. Yeah. That you, right. It's, I know it's so crappy. It's so crappy because- almost always in my experience, there's zero reason for it. Everything feels very fear-based. Um, yeah. And because I am sure it's not better, right? I mean, it, it worked, it's but different. it's, it's, yeah. Yeah. You, I mean, it, it was, it was really, that was, that project for me was like the hardest because when I went to the premiere, 
um, they didn't even, the director did not mention me. Oh my God. So gross. So I was almost on, in tears and I was like, here I am. I'm a screenwriter at my movie that I sold. I mean, let's be honest. I sold like that was the highest pitch sale of the year. So small, right. world's small, smallest violin on some level, but you know, it was very, yeah, it was very difficult. Um, anyway. It's so, um, it's so painful. And also I really appreciate, I think people see someone with the level of success that you have and just assume that yeah. every day you wake up and you eat, you know, gold bars served to you on a tray and, and, uh, Maybe that's I, not the right metaphor. Maybe not no. eat gold bars, but count them. Um, no. And you're just surrounded by rainbows and unicorns. And it's so hard to know. I mean, it's inspiring and really frustrating that even at this level, like this is the highest level of the thing. And there's so there's just so I don't much disrespect. That. You don't yeah. feel like this is the highest level or you oh, don't God, feel I like- I know I'm not the highest level um, because, and it's fine. I almost- I don't want to be at the highest level because those people probably live under so much pressure, mm -hmm. people calling them nonstop. And I don't know. I mean, I, I, I like my life. I like my family. I like, um, reading. I mean, I'll, I'll, I'm not kidding you. I love to read so much that like, that's part of my day. And I, I'm good with that. I'm fine. Not being the top of the top in the heap. So we buried the lead, but you just shared that you had a baby during the making of this movie. And we started out this conversation with you on the floor, recuperating from the world's worst divorce, basically. Um, and so that story has a different ending. That is a different, yes. I mean, that's part of one of the reasons I love to be so candid about it is because we're not just defined by other people's crappy choices about your own life mm -hmm. and you can actually um bloom so you and have a family now i have my real husband i call him <laughs> and i got pregnant with harper my first who's going to turn 17 next week during right at the end of legally blonde i was on the road with her at two months old wow wow wow, I had wow. A complete panic attack in san francisco and had to send her home. It mm -hmm. was, I don't know how that happened. I don't, but she's my Broadway baby. And right, literally isn't, isn't a huge musical fan. It didn't, it didn't go through the blood. It, it's not part of <laughs> what I you... didn't know that was, po I know, I didn't know that was possible. I didn't, she's not the big, she's an artist. She's an incredible, here's one of her paintings. Look at this, isn't it incredible. Can you see that? Oh my God. It's one of her dog portraits. She What are you saying? Those aren't photographs? No, those are her paintings. She's a great artist, but she's yeah. the thing about your kids is you just I just assume I'm gonna have a daughter and we're gonna sing all the time. Oh, we're gonna sing legally blonde together. But no. Oh god, no, no. No. Right. But then they end up having it's but, it's so extraordinary. Like that I'm child gonna... that you made made that painting yes. that you just showed me. Like what? Yes. Like I can't even, I still draw the same cat I made in kindergarten. Like that is so. That's her gift. And you have to let your children be who they are. And that is who she is. Fine. Fine. I'll work on that. I'll let them be who they are. Whatever, Heather. Um, she loves La La Land. That's, you know. That's a beautiful movie. Oh, I, I wept and like held my friend's hand. Like we were, <laughs> it was like, yeah, I can't even. Anyway. Um, somehow with all of this, um, you also managed, I don't know if it was, you know, a lot of people during COVID, some people baked bread and some people wrote novels. Um, how long did it take you to write The Trouble with Drowning? And how did you come up with the idea for this book? And can you talk a little bit about for people who haven't read it yet, what's yeah. it about and what, uh, what's the genesis it comes out October 17th. So you can pre-order it now on Amazon or Barnes and Noble, your favorite bookstore. Um, I've had this idea for like 30 years. Um, I love psychological thrillers. I love Hitchcock. I can basically do all of um, Rear Window. Like I can 
verbatim is one of my all time favorite movies. Um, so during COVID, yeah, I think everybody was just in despair and so confused and drowning. And I, it was a bleak time. And I started reading so obsessively again. I've always been a huge reader. I write down every single book I read, but I started like inhaling books like I did when I was about eight. And I fell so madly in love with books again and the escape that they provide that I was like, I want to do this. I want one. So I, I kind of dusted off that idea that I'd had years and years ago when I was a student at the university of Arizona, I transferred, but, um, and I just started writing obsessively. And did you sort of end up having like a specific writing ritual for this novel that was different from screenwriting or, or Broadway book writing? What, what was different? I, well, first of all, I went back and reread a few uh, great writing books. I, I so recommend um, Anne Lamott's Bird by Bird, one of my all-time favorites, and also Stephen King's On Writing. I read it several times. It's just such a beautiful book anyway, um, but it, it was really inspiring. And then the the cat writes a novel or whatever. I read that one. Um, what was wonderful about COVID for me, I'm a huge sleeper. Like now that I'm older, I struggle to with the whole thing, but I have always been like, I slept through the night at two weeks old. I'm just a, I love sleep. I love dreams. I get information from dreams. I love that little twilight of consciousness and unconsciousness that you get when you, you're not quite asleep. You're not quite awake. And I think it's such a really germane creative process. Right. Time. right. So I got to sleep on my natural schedule because I didn't have to wake up to take kids to school, which is about 10 hours a night, nine, 10 hours a night. And my husband is so lovely. He would let me work and sleep. And I laid there and I would just figure the novel out. So it really came to you in your dreams. A little bit, my dreams and then just laying in bed. And even when I woke up in the middle of the night at like three in the morning and instead yeah. of oh, crap, I got to get back to bed. I'd be like, oh, I get to think about my book. The wow. whole, it just allowed me an escape valve from the idiocy and the mania of the world. Yeah. Channeling it. And it's no wonder it's a little darker than everything I've else I've written. It was a really stressful, strange it was a dark time. time. Yeah. A dark time. So it was a way for me to kind of exercise some of my own demons and it's two very different characters and I think kind of the duality that I have within myself of um a lot of my better qualities and a lot of my darker angels um so for me it's really interesting even in talking with people about it now that I've written it I find that I was work some of the things I've been working out that I almost wasn't conscious of when I was writing it so can you just tell people for you know listeners at home yes. Tell me, about. yeah, like the sort of elevator pitch of the book. Um, basically, it's the story of Cat Lamb, who grew up in the foster system. She's writing a memoir about her kind of very troubled uh, childhood. She falls madly in love for the very first time with Jacob, and his mother just happens to be a literary hero of hers, a professor, a, you know, and a writer herself. So it's basically the life that Cat has always wanted. And when the relationship ends in Craters, so does Kat. And uh, Jacob, her her ex, starts dating the complete nightmare. You do not want your ex to start dating. And she becomes so obsessed with the new woman that she not only you know wants to push her off her pedestal, but replace her completely. I thought it was really... I guess I wanted to ask you the idea of having someone who grew up in foster care... Um, with a lot of trauma and a lot of broken relationships along the way, trying to find trust and right. comfort in an actual intimate relationship. Where did the idea of having Kat grow up the way she grew up come from? I knew I wanted to have someone with a troubled past, a fractured past with a lot of issues about trust. Um, so that to me seemed like a really interesting option. And I also wanted it to be, it, it, this this iteration isn't quite as much 
um, in the in the final well, the book that's on the shelves. But I really played with the way that Jacob was so completely intrigued by her and the way that she would dangle and there, it's still there dangle out little you know horrifying stories that he just couldn't believe she survived and how much he admired her um for surviving so you finished this book you wrote the entire thing first or did you go out to publishers with sample chapters sort of how did you navigate no, I wrote the whole thing I knew as a first time writer although I did write a YNA novel Freaky Monday with Mary Rogers um, that came out 15 years ago. Okay. Uh, but this is my adult debut. And also I'm, you know, I want to keep writing. I'm so glad this strike is over. I want to still, I'd love to do another show. I'd love to do more movies, more, you know, television, whatever. But this is an intentional, you know, move toward, I really want to become a novelist in addition, you know, well, uh, you are, I mean, The Trouble with Drowning is a novel written by Heather Hawk, and it is, um, it is a page turner. It is completely compelling. And I think people are going to really enjoy it. And you have such a like, you know, you have such a clear voice that, that you can sort of, I mean, you feel Heather through all the things that you write, you bring so much of yourself, your humor. Um, so name now- Don Lockwood. <laughs> Say that again. Have you gotten to the part? She has a pug named Don Lockwood, yes. which I always wanted a pug named Don Lockwood because I love Singing in the Rain. It's one of my favorite movies, but I don't want to call out to a Don anymore. Wink, wink. Right. right. So I got Understood. to make a, uh, so I got to live a by character. Kids. Exactly. <laughs> it's amazing. Um, all right. Well, first of all, thank you for all of the amazing stuff you've written and the endless, endless hours of entertainment and joy on screen and on stages that you have brought personally to me and my family. I can't wait to see yeah. the things that come up in your future. Um, before I let you go, is there a little known fact about you that you can share? A little known fact. Oh, there's so many weird details about me. Whatever, whatever comes to mind. Anything? Anything. Okay, this has got to be. Oh, gosh, I'm blowing it. Oh, my dad took me to Jaws when I was four years old. And it was the most terrifying moment of my entire life. But I think it was so wonderful that it totally, tra- it, I think it made me love it, stories. You know, and it, it, it's no wonder I turned into a screenwriter. I just was so dazzled by the form and that just completely changed my life. I'm terrified of the ocean, even though I it's live right now. so crazy that you say that because just last night I saw this Broadway play called The Shark is Broken. Yeah, how is it? I would love to see it. It is so compelling. I mean, I've seen the movie. There were yeah. people in that theater who, like you, had like a really transformative moment in their lives seeing yeah. it or know that movie. The way you describe Rear Window could be your one-woman show. Like, they could do every word of that movie oh. if you ask them. But the I simplicity can't. of having, you know, Richard Dreyfus and Robert Shaw and um, Roy Scheider during their downtime because that shark was broken for weeks and weeks and weeks and sort of first of all that he Ian wrote it about his father right it's written by Robert Shaw's son it's just so beautiful and truthful and it just really takes you inside a certain kind of time in making movies and a certain kind of actor and alcoholism and what it is to try to create something it's incredible, actually. I, and I, I would just... love to see it because I'm the I'm the four hour conversation about Jaws kind of lady. Yes. So I hope before it ends, you can fly in and see it, although maybe it'll have a, a, a you know, more or be filmed. Um, Heather, thank you for being on this podcast. I'm so grateful to have had this time with you today. Thank you so much. And I'm so glad you're enjoying the book. Love it. Truly love it. True, Wouldn't true. it be a great Netflix series? It It isn't already. Uh, well, hopefully now we'll go out with it because we couldn't. Yeah. No, now you can. The strike is over and good luck with all of it. And thank, thank you, you. Thank you for being here. Okay. Bye.